So we called our health and human service providers at the last press conference to uh, get busy. This week we're going to focus on education. Next week we're going to focus on workforce development. Providers will begin to feel the crunch uh, this month because the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is without the capacity to spend money in the absence of an operator. Both parties have sent out notices. I know the landlord here has received a notice saying that uh, I would not be able to pay rent for the month of August. And this press conference is for the Honorable State Representative Curtis Thomas, so I'm not going to take more than 90 seconds to impinge upon his time and your time. I just want to start by thanking him not only for being a great elected official in Philadelphia, but for being a great black elected official yes. in Philadelphia. Yes. Far too often yes. we forget where we come from. And uh, he's never forgotten. He's from the hood, he stays in the hood, and he fights for the hood. On education, as you know, in March, the governor presented a very bold and progressive proposed budget. We offer three. One, there needs to be universal pre-K. Three or four-year-olds across Pennsylvania should have access to early education services. And so the governor's proposed budget would invest $120 million for early education. K to 12, governor is prepared to invest $400 million. $140-some million right here in Philadelphia County. Now that $400 million, even though it will help, it will not get us back to the billion that we lost over the last four years in K through 12. The governor's proposed plan would provide 148 million additional dollars for higher education. Our four state related universities like Temple, University of Pitt, Penn State, and Lincoln would receive a 7% increase with a proviso that you do not raise tuition, that you hold down on tuition. All 14 Commonwealth schools, like Cheney, uh, will get an increase uh, so long as they hold on, on tuition. Cheney University, an all-time great institution, currently has an all-time low student enrollment and an all-time high budget deficit. You heard Representative Thomas talk about the need to enhance pre-K and K through 12 and even college. And if you think about it, that's extremely important from the beginning until your education is over. The reason why I say this is because I have a personal testament, and that personal testament is this. I was born and raised in North Philly, just a couple blocks from here. and. I'm a lawyer, I'm a college professor, I'm a newspaper journalist, I'm a magazine columnist. Is that because Michael Court is this great intellectual and scholar? No. The only reason that I'm here and the guy who lived next door to me in North Philly and the young lady who lived up the street from me in North Philly, the only reason I'm here and they're not is because of Cheney. It's as simple as that. I was able to get the type of education that laid a foundation that I couldn't have gotten anywhere else. No disrespect to Temple, to Penn, to all these great white institutions, but it's no way I could have been the student government president there. It's no way I could have been on the board of trustees there. It's no way I could have been the senior class president. I got that opportunity because I was at a black school, and not just a great education. I got a chance to see professors with PhDs in mathematics and I got a chance to see administrators running a business called Cheney's, Cheney University. So now I'm looking at these role models whose skin is like mine, whose nose is like mine, whose yes. lips, yes. whose hair, well, maybe not yes. hair, but everything else is pretty much the same. So I'm looking at them and saying, wow, if they can do it, 
I can do it. That's why I got a full academic scholarship to Ohio State School of Law. Is it again because I'm this great guy? No, it's because Cheney laid the foundation. That's why there's such a need. In my last 30 seconds, let me tell you what the problem is. The problem is decades of racial discrimination against Cheney. Think about this. In 1969, in our lifetimes, in 1969, the U.S. government designated 10 states that were discriminating against black students. 10 states. Of course, usual suspects there, Mississippi, Georgia, North Carolina, but Pennsylvania is in that group. Think about that. 1969, the federal government looked at Mississippi, Alabama, North Carolina, and included Pennsylvania in 1969 saying, you're discriminating against black students in higher education. That's 69. Fast forward to 1983. As you all know, state colleges get federal funding. So each year, the federal government wants to make sure that the states are doing the right thing. So they said, hey, we got these guidelines. You meet the guidelines, you get the federal funding, and we won't penalize you. Do you know that it wasn't until 1983, 1983, that Pennsylvania submitted an anti-discrimination plan to the federal government that they finally accepted? 82, rejected. 81, rejected. 80, 70s. How could that be? Because of what Pennsylvania does to black schools. So what do we do now? And Representative Thomas alluded to this thing about this deal or this merger, this collaboration. We have this thing that my group, Heating Cheney's Call, is talking about now. It's called Colorblind Collaboration, Yes, Racist Murder, No. What does that mean? To establish a 21st century Cheney Commission. Cheney University has is, is, is witnessed some major challenges academically and financially. It's one of the 14 Commonwealth schools, and it's one of the anchors in Chester County, in, 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 in the rural part of our, our state. Under the COVID years, under the stimulus years, um, people forgot the Cheney was over there in, 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 in uh, Chester County. Mm -hmm. and, and people just kind of did what they wanted to do and what they thought was best. You and I out here uh, know of some of the challenges, but don't know exactly what those challenges are. And so one of the things I'm asking um, governor to do and our colleagues to do, to move aggressively in establishing this 21st century Cheney Commission. It will not cost anything to do that, but it will bring to the table some people that can realistically look at what's going on in Cheney and figure out a way of resolving those challenges without talking about merger or closing. Um, can't close Cheney. It's like you can't close Lincoln, you can't close Temple. We need all of those institutions. And so, but take a hard look at it. Um, how to uh, move Cheney to becoming that kind of beacon of excellence that we used to look to Cheney and all of our other universities in, in achieving. Also in this budget, proposed budget, special education is going to get a hundred million dollar uh, increase. So we think that, that with the governor's proposed numbers, um, young people can have a running start in Pennsylvania. And like the governor, uh, I believe that if we can spend 40000 a year on the 50000 plus folk in Pennsylvania prisons, we can spend 25000 plus yes. on every child's education. Yes. Mm -hmm. And dispel this notion that in Pennsylvania, it sometimes looked like it's easier to get a scholarship to go to jail mm -hmm. than get one to go to Yale. Mm -hmm. and, and so this would be a big step towards that. Now, as always, people have said, uh, how are you going to pay for this? And the governor's budget never got a debate or conversation. The majority party, uh, which has 119 members in the House, and 20, 27, 
2728 uh, in the Senate submitted an alternative budget. Did away with the goals for universal pre-K. Did away with the 400 million in K through 12. Did away with the proposed investment in higher education. They have said to Temple University and other universities, take 3% this year and then let us try to work back, uh, work back on getting the 7%, maybe some years down the road. But we can only give you 3% um, for 1516. The governor had no other choice but to reject. And because the majority party has 119 uh, in the House and a majority number in the Senate, they were able to pass their budget and send it to the governor without one Democratic vote. There was not one Democratic vote for that alternative proposed budget. And so we, the impasse that we have is that the governor has vetoed the proposed operating budget, has vetoed the fiscal code, which provides the numbers for funding the operating budget, the public school code, which outlines how money in the budget will be spent on pre-K, K through 12, and what have you. And the governor vetoed the liquor privatization and the problem with liquor privatization because I think that both Democrat and Republicans that might um, believe in privatizing liquor uh, but the problem is is you got 4,700 people who would be out of work automatically 69% of them are single mothers raising their children and if you go, if you privatize, the private sector clearly will not pay the meaningful wages and benefits that employees consider um, receive under the uh, current arrangement. So, governor, uh, like myself and many other people, was not prepared to do that. Um, Unemployment in many communities is, is, is bad enough. We do not need to add to it. We need to be uh, working through things rather than aggravating a bad situation. So the liquor privatization bill was, was uh, vetoed. And the pension reform bill was vetoed. Yes. And the reason that it was vetoed is because the majority party picked winners and losers. Now anytime the legislature has taken steps to change the circumstances under which uh, lawmakers are able to function. They've always included the judges. Under this pension reform bill, judges were exempted. Mm -hmm. Correction officers mm -mm. was exempted. State police was exempted. And then the pension reform bill, what it says to um, two-thirds of the House and Senate, and that is, uh, we know that you will be up for re-election next year. Once you're sworn in, you become a new hire. Huh. So whatever pension reform, pension bill you were under, it's all out the window. You uh. become a new hire and, and will be subjected to the new terms of pension reform. And so this notion of picking winners and losers on, around pension reform became problematic and, 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 and therefore the governor had to uh, veto. What I'm asking you and our friends to do is to get on the phone and in your packet should be a list of all of the majority party members
who voted no to the governor's proposed budget. Need to call them and need to urge them to do a couple of things. Number one, on August the 25th, we should sustain the governor's veto. Sustain the governor's veto. Do not override. Because if we override it, then the alternative proposal to the governor's budget will be the working document on the table. So we have to sustain the governor's veto on the operating budget. We should sustain the governor's veto on the fiscal code. Because the fiscal code provides revenues that uh, can pay for what we need in education. And I've laid out some recommendations. And we don't need to take all of them in order to get where we need to be. Uh, raising the income tax. Currently it's 3.07. Raise it to 3.7, which would generate $1.1 billion. And I have a couple of proposals which says that if we're going to raise the personal income tax, and some of it or all of the personal income tax is going towards education, put it in a lockbox so that people do not have to worry about that money going into the general fund and being yes. used for things other than yes. education. Um, so that's a proposal that I have out there to put it in a lockbox. But the point is, we need to say to these majority members, where you are on the issue of personal income tax. From all the polling that we've done, people have said that I don't want to pay no more taxes to the, to, to the government. But I don't mind giving up a couple extra dollars if I know you're going to spend it where you're supposed to spend it and not come up with all of these quick fixes and gimmicks that we sometimes get caught up in. Secondly, tax Marcellus drilling, yes. 6%. Yes. 6%. With an understanding that 2% continue to go to the local municipalities. Because one of the things that the previous governor did was to create this adversarial relationship between local communities where drilling is going on versus communities where there is no drilling going on. Because what Governor Corbett said is that rather than tax the industry, there will be an access fee. There will be a fee that the drillers have to pay to the local communities in which the drilling is, is taking place. Rather than have a statewide um, distribution of Marcellus drilling uh, benefits. And so my proposal says raise the 6%, which would not be uh, out of line with where it's going on in other states. And what I would like to see done, continue the 2% to those local communities where the drilling is taking place. Take 1% and create a Pennsylvania legacy fund. Because so often when we see this windfall, we'll go grab up all the money that we can grab up and spend it right away. And I'm saying that this is the time to um, create uh, something like a legacy fund which can be used later on to help with these issues like education. Because five years from now, clearly, the money that we spend on a child's education today would double if not triple five years from now. And so we need to uh, begin the day to try and create a situation where we have something that we can look to as things um, um, where we might run into problems. And so I'm asking that 1% of the 6% go into a Pennsylvania legacy fund. And the other 3% go towards education. Now that would generate uh, just 3% on the drilling tax 
would generate $158.5 million. Taxing, taxing smokeless tobacco. Let's say that. Now, I don't, I don't, I can't, I have not figured out um, how that industry became so powerful, but we cannot, every time you, you act like you want to tax cigars or pipes or um, smokeless tobacco, we run into a wall. It's okay to tax cigarettes, but do not touch my pipe and my smokeless tobacco and my cigars. Now, I don't know what it is about cigars, <laughs> you know. I have not figured it out, but we need you to impress upon people that by taxing smokeless tobacco and cigars, just those two things, we can generate $59 million. Close the Delaware loophole by requiring combined reporting, and that's the corporations that organize in Delaware, doing business in Pennsylvania, and, and file all of these separate reports, and we said put them together. Save some money um, for them and for the Commonwealth. But, and so by closing the loophole, we can generate $163 million. Don't privatize liquor stores, modernize them. And there is a Republican out of Delaware County who is a progressive Republican who has put forth a proposal to modernize the liquor stores rather than privatize them. And it would generate $125 million. And last, one, one of the things that I've been pushing for some time now because we're at this point where part of the governor's proposal called for expanded sales taxes, tax legal services, tax milk, tax clothes. And there's, there's resistance on both sides for expanded sales tax proposal in Pennsylvania. One of the things that I've been saying for some time now, and that is we have a number of internet providers who are not principally based in Pennsylvania, but mm -hmm. do business in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and pay no taxes. Yes, absolutely. And pay no taxes. Absolutely. Governor Corbett did a demonstration program uh, during his term with M Amazon, which is, which is not principally based in Pennsylvania, but do a lot of business in Pennsylvania. And he taxed it generated $23 million. Nice. They, they tell us that we could generate close to $600 million mm -hmm. if we just require some registration and taxation of the companies to do business in Pennsylvania. And so rather than expand the sales tax, I ask that we turn towards um, this windfall. And, and just imagine the kind of activity going on with your friends around Christmas and Thanksgiving and mm -hmm. around holidays is unbelievable. We do not get a return on the people who steal on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and when there's theft with online sales activities, our law enforcement community has to pursue it. And when we do that, you are paying for that investigation and those efforts to uh, catch perpetrators. But nothing comes back to the Commonwealth. I mean, when you catch somebody and you, and you either get the goods and, 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 and products back, there's nothing that comes back to the, to the Commonwealth, to the taxpayer. And so I think that it's time for us to look at that as, as an option for generating uh, the kind of additional revenues that we that we need. And so you can take take your pick. But but one thing is for sure that if you put all of this together, we have more than enough money to fund pre-K, to do universal pre-K, 
to put 400 million in K through 12, to put 148 million in higher education, and to put 100 million in special ed. We can do it and still have some money left over. And I don't think that, I think one of the message that we need you uh, to say to these members, okay, like you, we have lofty goals for what we want to see with our children, our communities, and with our commonwealth. Like you, we want the best. But you can't keep getting the best, and you're not putting anything out there to help with achieving the best. You, you can't, as I say sometimes on the floor of the house, you can't expect Cadillac performance from a Volkswagen. Mm -hmm. It's a good car. But it will never give you the kind of performance um, that you expect from a Cadillac or an Infiniti or, or, or one of them high-end automobiles. And so we need to say to our friends, um, it's time for us to not only follow this bold and aggressive proposal, but also to support the revenue enhancements to make it happen. And areas of concern that I want us to deal with the week of August the 25th and into September. Education is something we need to get done now because of all the stuff that we're talking about. There's nothing in the Pennsylvania Constitution that says that we have a statutory obligation to um, engineer pension reform or deal with liquor privatization. The, the Constitution gives us a statutory responsibility to develop a system of public education that is efficient and proficient. That's our, that's our legal responsibility. And I would love it if we were in Arkansas. Um, during my career, I had a chance to uh, interact with people from other states. In Arkansas, they only meet three months out of the year. But when they come together in January, they spend maybe a month to talk about what are our priorities. What, what is important to us for the year of 2016? More often than not, it's education. So if they have a pot of $500 million, they take a look at what they need to do in education and spend that money there and then deal with these other issues with whatever you have left. But your priority starts out with with education and so we need to do that. Um, it would not hurt for us, some of you remember when Governor Rendell um, became governor first year. We didn't get a budget done until around December the 11th or 12th. Um, so we have, we have had these extended periods, and when I say get a budget done, what I'm talking about is finalizing the budget. The operating budget was done early, so that we could at least spend some spend money on some of our bills. And what I'm asking this time is do what we need to do to deal with this education situation. I was talking to Dr. Hyde on Monday in an appeal system. The district is expecting its first quarterly payment in September, which would run from September, August, September, October. And, and he tells me that uh, without that first payment, we're talking about $412 million. And one of the things that I would like to see happen, um, just in this community, from Spring Garden to Hunting Park, and from 33rd Street to I-95, with the exception of Carver High School of Engineering and Science, and maybe Kappa. I don't know of any other middle schools 
that have STEM mat material, mm -hmm. STEM teachers, mm -hmm. STEM infrastructure, or even STEM mentors. And so one of my dreams uh, for this 15, 16 year is to put a STEM center uh, in, in different parts that either work directly with these schools or um, I'd like to see every eighth grader graduating with some understanding of STEM and some idea of how they can pursue a career in, in STEM. And the governor's proposed budget offers one part of, of an overall strategy. The governor has asked the FIA board to set aside seven and a half million dollars for a STEM scholarship program. So for young people who pursue careers in STEM, 7.5 million. Now, our majority appropriations chairman, uh, Representative Adon, uh, has indicated that that money is there. The board just needs to act on it. So that's one part of it. Another part of it is the Pennsylvania Department of Education uh, has received um, somewhere, I think, in, in the neighborhood of $40, $50 million from the federal government to establish these 21st century centers um, throughout Pennsylvania. And one of those centers could be a STEM and so that's that's one of my goals and I'm available to work with any provider and um, that's interested in in doing that. So uh, we know what our what we gotta do. Um, either target one or ask some friends to get in touch with with any of these members and say to them, I need an affirmative vote from you on the 25th of August to one, sustain the governor's budget and move the education part of the budget forward. And that would not take a whole lot. We, we know what the numbers are. If you just deal with the governor's proposal, I think it's about $888 million to do what he wants to do. And so we don't have to fight now over all the proposed revenue enhancements. Take the ones that you can live with and get a budget in place that when these schools open after Labor Day and these child care centers need to open and these pre-K centers need to open, that they don't have to worry about where's the money going to come from. Um, and, and I share with you, you can do it. I know people say sometimes, well, you know, uh, Rep. Thomas, I think we need um, yeah, term notes. Um, and, and my answer to people, there are not, they're currently there are term limits. Every 18 months, we are for re-election. Every 18 months, we are for re-election. So between August 25th and April of next year, all of these guys are going to be up for re-election. Now is the time to find out where you are on education. And, and, and don't tell me I share your dreams, but you got to tell me are you committed to yes. what's necessary to make that dream a reality. Yes. So, you know, it's nice to say what I like, but what are you prepared to do uh, to make it happen? So you and I uh, have the ability, I'm, I'm calling folks. Um, I've paid attention to every uh, vacancy. We've had about four or five vacancies um, in, in the house uh, over the last month. And I've, been, I've been paying attention to all of them. Um, and I can tell you, uh, with, without the names of all of them, they're all progressive minded. They're all prepared to support education. And, and they're all of, of the opinion 
that all of this is interconnected. You can't just do pre-K and say, I don't want to worry about K through 12. You can't say that you're interested in K through 12 without talking about higher education. And somewhere in the middle, we'll talk more about it next week, is no high school in Florida should be without the capacity to, to enter into a 13th, 14th year agreement with some either two-year or four-year college in Philadelphia County. So that every young person will have the ability to build on their high school experience in a way that gets them ready for the global marketplace. We can no longer just have this situation where if you end up someplace, you get someplace. If you don't get any place, then you can't get it. No, we, we have, all of this is connected. Mm -hmm. And now is a good time to start talking about this together rather than um, as isolated systems. Okay, so can I count on you on that? Yes. Can I count on you on that? Yes. Different, different issues and concerns. I'm finding, I'm finding so many, so many different, mentality different mentality today. It seems, it seems hard. hard. It seems it seems challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything, everything else, else is a challenge. Else is a challenge. Um, um, so, so, so I'm ready. For I'm this. ready.